Welcome to the Exploring Antibiotic Use and the Problem of Resistance conference call. My name is Victoria, and I will be your operator for today's call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode, and later we will conduct a question and answer session. I will now turn the call over to Christy Wien. Christy, you may begin. Thank you, Victoria. Yes, this is Christy Wien from Lake Superior Quality Innovation Network, or Lake Superior Quinn. Lake Superior Quinn represents Minnesota, Michigan, and Wisconsin under the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services Quality Improvement Organization Program. This webinar is intended for all nursing homes in Michigan, Minnesota, and Wisconsin who are participating in the National Nursing Home Quality Care Collaborative, and we're really glad you're here with us today. This webinar is the first in a four-part series. These webinars, which include how to implement an antibiotic stewardship program, as well as how to prevent, manage, and track C. difficile infections are designed to assist your nursing home in improving quality of care and outcomes for residents, as well as meet the reform of requirements for long-term care facilities infection control requirements. All lines will be muted during the webinar. However, if you have questions during the presentation, please share them in chat. There will also be an opportunity to ask questions after the presentation. Hopefully, you have all had the opportunity to view the 15-minute Exploring Antibiotics webinar prior to today. This webinar provides a succinct review of bacteria characteristics, how antibiotics work, antibiotic classifications, how antibiotics are used, and tools to choose antibiotics. We will build on these key points in our presentation today. The points of the Exploring Antibiotics webinar are that antibiotics are a powerful treatment against infections due to bacteria. Choosing antibiotics wisely requires taking into account a number of factors regarding the targeted bacteria and the individual being treated. Antibiotics are not a substitute for the immune system. They work in conjunction with the immune system, and we'll talk about that in a bit. And there are a number of tools that should be used to guide antibiotic selection. You may want to keep this short webinar in mind as you develop staff education regarding antibiotic stewardship. It's a great introduction and a review for your staff and should help get the conversation about infection control and or antibiotic stewardship started. In the webinars and virtual learning sessions that Lake Superior Quinn has offered to nursing homes, we have emphasized the importance of developing the culture in your nursing home to better support quality improvement. <laughs> As a reminder, the National Nursing Home Quality Care Collaborative Change Package offers strategies that your team can implement to develop and enhance your quality culture. In this change package is a bundle of strategies implemented by high-performing nursing homes to prevent healthcare-acquired infections. Please refer to the link on this slide to access this change bundle. It describes actions utilized by nursing homes and supported by literature to help prevent healthcare acquired infections. During this webinar, we will provide a foundation for the rest of the webinars that are included in this series. After this webinar today, you should be able to describe how antibiotics work, Describe the risks and benefits of antibiotic use. Describe what is meant by antibiotic resistance. And describe strategies to de decrease the development and spread of antibiotic resistance. According to a study done by the Centers for Disease Control earlier this year, antibiotic use and misuse in nursing homes is widespread. 70% of nursing home residents are prescribed one or more courses of antibiotics each year, and up to 75% of those antibiotics that are prescribed may be unnecessary. This misuse or overuse of antibiotics in nursing homes, as well as in other care settings, should be of great concern to all of us. Today we will discuss why we should care about this and what we can do to decrease the unnecessary use of antibiotics in our nursing homes. Antibiotics are great in many ways. They are one of the biggest breakthroughs in healthcare and have saved countless lives. Diseases that used to be considered fatal are now assumed treatable. Penicillin, the first commercialized antibiotic, was discovered in 1928 by 
Xander Fleming. While it wasn't distributed among the general public until 1945, it was widely used in World War II for surgical and wound infections among the Allied forces. It was hailed as a miracle drug, and a future free of infectious diseases was considered. It is interesting to note that when Fleming won the Nobel Prize for his discovery, he warned of bacteria becoming resistant to penicillin in his acceptance speech. But how is it that antibiotics work against the bacteria that cause infection? Antibiotics work with the body's immune system to decrease bacteria in two ways, either by inhibiting the growth of bacteria, and these are called bacteriostatic antibiotics, or by killing the bacteria, and these are the bacteriocidal antibiotics. Bacteriostatic antibiotics act on the internal workings of the bacterial cell to stop it dividing and so slow down the advance of the infection. A bacterial population that divides more slowly, or that can't divide at all, is much more easily dealt with by the body's immune system. So that's how we talked about before that the antibiotics and the immune system work together. Bacteriostatic infections do not kill the bacteria directly, but it slows their growth so that antibiotics and white blood cells of the immune system destroy them more quickly. Antibiotics that are predominantly bacteriostatic include the tetracyclines, the macrolides, chloramphenicol, and trimethoprim. These antibiotics all need to work in a similar way, by binding to part of the ribosome structure that controls the synthesis of proteins in a bacterial cell. Most tend to act more slowly than the quinolones, which have a similar mechanism of action, but those can also be bactericidal at some doses. Now, many bacteriocidal antibiotics work by altering the biochemical pathway through which bacteria make the cell wall. As the antibiotic is taken into the cell, it inhibits cell wall formation, which then makes the cell wall thinner than usual. As the cell divides, then you have two daughter cells. They also have weaker cell walls, and they cannot strengthen them because they are also prevented from making all the necessary components. As the daughter cells try to divide subsequently, the cell walls of the daughter bacteria fail. Lysis of the cell follows and the bacterium dies. Penicillin antibiotics work in this way, as do the cephalosporins. Other antibiotics in the aminoglycoside class are also bacteriocidal in some infections, although they're bacteriostatic in others. What they do is bind part of an intracellular structure, or the ribosome. This usually assembles amino acids together to form complete proteins. When the antibiotic is bound to the ribosome, it can't make proteins efficiently, and fewer proteins, or proteins that contain mistakes, are made. Vital proteins are required by the bacterium and therefore in short supply, and the cell dies. The quinolones disable bacterial enzymes that normally replicate bacterial DNA, making it impossible for the bacterium to divide. This happens quickly, and the affected bacteria die within a few hours. Quinolone antibiotics enter human cells very easily, so they're often useful for treating bacteria that penetrate and invade cells. The antibiotic has no toxic effects on the human cell itself, because its own enzymes for copying DNA are completely different. All antibiotics can also be described as either narrow spectrum or broad spectrum. Those with a narrow spectrum of action can kill only a small number of species of bacteria, maybe just one. There are some examples of narrow spectrum antibiotics on this slide. Broad spectrum antibiotics, on the other hand, are active against a wide variety of bacterial species. Since the broad spectrum antibiotics are also active against bacteria that are beneficial to us, it is best to use a narrow spectrum antibiotic if it is found to be susceptible to the targeted bacteria. So often it might be tempting to just choose a broad spectrum antibiotic if you're not sure if it's going to um, be targeted, but that's not a good idea if, you, if you're able to really figure out what antibiotic is appropriate because you might be 
killing really good antibiotic, good bacteria at the same time. And on this slide, there are some examples of broad-spectrum antibiotics. Although antibiotics are powerful tools in preventing and curing illness, it is helpful to be aware of potential side effects, and I'm sure most of you are aware of, of all of these, if not many of them. Allergic reactions are, um, do happen, and these can range from skin rash to severe anaphylactic reactions that could be life-threatening. Gastrointestinal effects such as abdominal pain, diarrhea, anorexia, nausea, and vomiting can occur. And these are the effects often seen with Clostridium difficile infections. You can also have liver and kidney toxicity or ototoxicity or hearing loss. And um, neurological effects such as headache, dizziness, or even more severe effects such as neuropathy. Antibiotics may also increase the overall cost of care by leading to emergency room visits for treatment of allergic reactions as well as the development of severe diarrheal disease, um, such as those caused by C. difficile infection. These conditions can not only be costly, but they result in increased morbidity and mortality. The table on this slide is a great resource to help identify the side effects for each class of antibiotic. This table can be accessed by using the link on this slide. So as wonderful as antibiotics are, and as critical as they can be to assisting the body to overcome an infection, we need to discuss the growing problem of antibiotic resistance. And so I'll now turn the presentation over to Kathy Nichols to discuss antibiotic resistance. Thanks, Christy. So what is antibiotic resistance? It's the ability of bacteria to change or adapt to resist the effects of an antibiotic. These resistant bacteria continue to multiply. To, to multiply, and they can cause harm to an individual as well as they can be spread person to person from non-human sources like animals, or we can be exposed from, from contaminated food sources. These bacteria are often referred to as superbugs or drug-resistant bacteria. The CDC informs us that germs that contaminate food can become resistant because of the use of antibiotics in people and in food animals. For some germs, like the bacteria Salmonella, it is primarily the use of antibiotics in food animals that increases resistance. Because of the link between antibiotic use in food-producing animals and the occurrence of antibiotic-resistant infections in humans, Antibiotics that are medically important to treating infections in humans should be used in food-producing animals only under vet oversight and only to manage and treat infectious disease, not to promote growth. Every time an antibiotic is used, sensitive bacteria die, but resistant bacteria are left to grow and multiply. The use of antibiotics is the single most important factor leading to antibiotic resistance around the world. Simply using antibiotics creates resistance, and widespread use of the antibiotics has promoted the spread of antibiotic resistance. We'd now like to show you a short video. It's less than two minutes. If you should have any technical difficulties on your end, pulling it out or viewing it, just hang with us. But we hope that you'll enjoy this demonstration as much as we have. So we ended up building with basically a petri dish, except that it's two feet by four feet. And the way we set it up is that there are nine bands. At the base of each of these bands, we put a normal petri dish thick agar with different amounts of antibiotic. On the outside, there's no antibiotic. Just in from that, there's barely more than the E. coli can survive. Inside of that, there's 10 times as much, 100 times, and then finally the middle band has 1,000 times as much antibiotic. And then across the top of it, for a thin agar, that bacteria can move around it. The background is black because of ink in it, and the bacteria appear in white. First, you see it 
spread in the area where there's no antibiotics, but the bacteria no longer survive. Then a mutant appears on the right, which is resistant to the antibiotic, it spreads until it starts to compete with other mutants around it. When these mutants hit the next boundary, they do have to pause and develop new mutations to make it ten times as much antibiotics. And you see the different mutants repeat this at 100. And after about 11 days, they finally make it into a thousand times as much antibiotic as the wild has survived. And so we can see by this process of accumulating successive mutations that bacteria, which are normally sensitive to antibiotics, can evolve resistance to extremely high concentrations in a short period of time. Wow, wasn't that dramatic? It's pretty amazing how quickly that antibiotic resistance spreads. It's important for us to understand the impact and slow the pace of antibiotic resistance. The pace of development of antibiotic resistance is now faster than the development of new drugs. Since 1980, the rate of development and approval of new antibiotics has steadily declined. We can no longer assume new drugs, new antibiotics will be coming out that will be effective against resistant bacteria that are now present in our communities. In fact, we have situations now where we do not have antibiotics to treat common bacterial infections in hospitals. The bacteria are resistant to all our current antibiotics. It's important to understand that the human body doesn't become resistant to the antibiotic. The bacteria becomes resistant. This means if you get a bacterial infection, the usual antibiotics will no longer be effective. A less accessible or last resort antibiotic may need to be used, and in some cases, options for antibiotic use can run out. Antibiotic-resistant bacteria are spread in multiple ways. They're spread by contact with a person with an antibiotic-resistant infection, and they're spread through contact with something that has been touched by a person with an infection, something in the environment, a healthcare worker's hands, medical instruments, or contact with live animals, food, or water-carrying antibiotic-resistant bacteria. These are some of the growing antibiotic-resistant bacteria throughout the United States and the world. According to the CDC, each year in the United States, at least 2 million people become infected with bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics and at least 23,000 people die each year as a direct result of these infections. The CDC has listed the top 18 drug resistant threats in the United States. They are divided into categories of concern, urgent, serious, and concerning. And right now in long-term care facilities, we're very familiar with two of the urgent concerns. These include Clostridium difficile and Carbenicum and resistant bacteria. So, how can we decrease the spread of antibiotic resistance? First and foremost, promote hand hygiene. This includes all staff, not just nurses and nursing assistants. Are you promoting hand hygiene among your residents? giving them frequent opportunities to wash their hands with soap and water and have access to alcohol-based cleansers when water isn't available. You should also practice good infection control management, preventing transmission of infections among residents, staff, and visitors. Assure your environment is clean and sanitized following evidence-proven guidelines. Identify and treat infections appropriately. We're not advocating eliminating the use of antibiotics. They need to be used appropriately, but not for viruses or for colonization. Avoid the use of urinary catheters unless they're needed. And assure residents and staff vaccinations are up to date. Now, we'd like you to put some chat 
chatter going in our chat um, function. So on the right-hand side under chat, please um, answer the question, what do you feel contributes to antibiotic overuse or misuse in nursing homes? We'll come back to this question, but we'd like you to add, add some things. We'll go ahead a bit and then come back. So another way to decrease antibiotic resistance is committing to improve appropriate antibiotic reuse and create a culture that supports antibiotic stewardship. The new requirement of participation includes implementing an antibiotic stewardship program, and this will be covered in the third and fourth webinar in this series. Identify physician, nursing, and pharmacy leads responsible for promoting and overseeing antibiotic stewardship activities in the facility. It takes designated leadership to be successful. A best practice is to include antibiotic stewardship responsibilities in the job descriptions of the medical director, nurse leads, and general nursing staff and the pharmacist. Wow, you've got a great list here of what's contributing to the use. And we agree. Staff and families asking for antibiotics are expecting some type of action lack of knowledge regarding the true symptoms of an infection. When the resident goes to the hospital, they're almost always diagnosed with a UTI. So we know the problems with colonization, even if, even if those symptoms may not be um, as clear cut, that that's what's causing what's going on. Sometimes monitoring is safer than jumping into treatment. Communicate with your staff and families by discussing the plan for monitoring, follow-up, and treatment, and share specifics about why waiting and monitoring is appropriate. And we've included some tip sheets at the end of this session that may be helpful for your family and uh, resident education. Also, we know that another common factor is staff are afraid they'll miss something and the resident will become ill quickly. We know that we need to educate staff also. Great comments in chat. Thank you all very much. Let's go back to our slides. How else can we um, come up um, appropriate use of antibiotics? It's by working collaboratively. Work collaboratively with your medical director and your attending physicians. Include your pharmacist and share information with your interdisciplinary team and staff. Ensure that policies are in place and clinicians have the opportunity to receive and review microbiology reports and antibiograms to detect trends in antibiotic resistance. Then develop and implement policies that encourage best practices for antibiotic prescribing, including the establishment of minimum criteria for prescri prescribing antibiotics and review of antibiotic appropriateness and resistance patterns. Develop facility-specific treatment recommendations. Use standing orders or care pathways to guide when changes in condition are noted. These may be around urinary tract symptoms or upper respiratory symptoms or skin and soft tissue infections. This will help staff determine what signs and symptoms suggest bacterial infection and the potential need for an antibiotic. Other ways to assist is to implement best practices. Avoid the use of antibiotics to treat viral illnesses, such as cold, influenza, and viral, viral gastroenteritis. Use antibiotics only for as long as needed. This includes both questioning the use of antibiotics prophylactically to prevent an infection, someone who's on a daily antibiotic, even though they show no signs or symptoms, and we're also seeing new research which is saying that oftentimes we've been told to, to continue using and taking your antibiotic till it's gone, but now new research is showing that perhaps we should only be taking antibiotics for as long as we have symptoms. And I think more of this um, data and research will be coming forward. Also, don't treat colonization with antibiotics. If the urine culture comes back with bacteria in it, 
Don't treat it unless the person is symptomatic. Remember that treatment with antibiotics is only appropriate when the practitioner determines on the basis of an assessment and evaluation that the most likely cause of the resident's symptoms is a bacterial infection. Obtain microbiology cultures prior to starting antibiotics when possible so antibiotics can be adjusted or stopped when appropriate. Work with your lab to see what reports they can provide you about your facility's antibiotic use and what resistant bacteria have been present in your home. Request an antibiogram. An antibiogram is a profile of antimicrobial susceptibility testing results of a specific microorganism to a battery of antimicrobial drugs. This profile is generated by the lab. The data are summarized periodically and presented showing percentages of organisms tested that are susceptible to a particular antimicrobial drug. This can be shared with your clinician and shows what resistant strains have been in your home over time. This helps with decision making about antibiotic prescribing. Also use tools and resources to assist with good data collection and assessment to assess changes in a resident's condition. Engage staff, residents, and families. Teach staff to question antibiotic orders that are not supported by the resident's clinical symptoms, lab testing, imaging, or culture results. Engage residents and their family members in addressing the need to improve antibiotic use. Provide them education that explains why antibiotic stewardship is important for residents, staff, and families. Review the facility's microbiology reports to detect trends in antibiotic resistance. These are actions that support compliance with new infection control and antibiotic stewardship components and the regulation on reform of long-term care requirements. This slide shows an educational tool that's put out by the Centers for Disease Control, and it's titled, What You Need to Know About Antibiotics in a Nursing Home, and it's written for families and for residents. Please use this tool as appropriate for your facility. Next, we're going to have a polling question. It's always best to start an antibiotic if you're not certain if there is a bacterial infection. Jennifer, can you pull up this question for our audience to be able to answer whether or not they think this question is true or false? So on the right-hand side, pick true or false and make sure that you hit submit on the right. We're going to take a few seconds for everyone to submit their answer. All right, Jennifer, as soon as you've got the results, will you put them up on the screen for us? So, it's always best to start. What a smart group. The answer is false. There are very real harms and side effects from antibiotic use in situations where the need is unclear. These include the development of C. difficile infections and the development of future antibiotic resistance. We've got another polling question for you. It is best to stick with antibiotics you know have worked before. Is this true or is it false? You can now pick your answer on the right-hand side of your screen. All right.
right. Our, our time is up. Let's see the results, Jennifer, when you're ready. Oh, a little more uncertainty on this one. It's best to stick with antibiotics you know have worked before. The answer is false. Antibiotic choice should always be made based on the specifics of the situation, taking into account the patient condition and additional data such as the cultures and known resistance sensitivity patterns in the facility. See a few other people are answering in chat. So, Another aspect is monitoring your infections. And what do the new federal regulations say? This tag infection prevention and control is now number F880. We all have to learn the new numbers. The, the tag has stayed much the same in saying that the system for preventing and identifying, reporting, investigating, and controlling infections and communicable diseases for all residents, staff, volunteers, visitors, and other individuals providing services under a contractual agreement based upon the facility assessment conducted according to additional new regulations and following acceptable national standards. So we've got written standards, policies, and procedures in accordance with the TAG Regulation F. 83.80, and these regulations had not changed, and they were effective beginning last year of 11-28-2016. Each facility must have a system for recording incidents of infections identified under the IPCP, which is the Infection Prevention and Control Practitioner, and corrective actions taken by the facility by 11-28-2016. So these reg regulations are already in place and being enforced. And the third one is you must have an antibiotic stewardship program by 11-28-2017. And part of this series is to help you prepare, if you've not already done so, for that what needs to be included in that antibiotic stewardship program. And this will be coming up in the following webinars. So in summary today, we want to conclude with that antibiotic resistance is a global health threat. If you begin to look at the literature that's out there, we have serious concerns here in the United States, but throughout the world there are serious um, infections, bacterial infections that are taking place, um, and we are seeing more and more resistance. The appropriate use of antibiotics is key to your resident's safety, and implementing best practices will enhance your organization's infection prevention and control programs. On the next slide, we've got some excellent resources that will help you to supplement the information that's been shared in this webinar and in the webinars that are coming up you'll again get additional resources the centers for disease control has got an uh, an excellent uh, web page on the use of antibiotics and managing antibiotics in nursing home the agency for health care research and quality has got a uh, more resources also for healthcare acquired infections and long term care facilities. The Minnesota Department of Health has an antibiotic stewardship program toolkit specifically for long term care facilities. And many of these links, as well as other resources, are present on our um, LSQIN or Lake Superior QIN website. Now, I'd like to turn it over to Christy, who's going to give some information about our upcoming webinar. Thanks, Kathy. Before I do that, I want to address some of the questions that we've got in chat. So Robin was wondering, I think this is a question out to everyone that's listening, 
She's wondering if anyone has worked on educating the providers for writing orders for antibiotics with parameters when the antibiotic is able to be discontinued early due to the symptoms that have resolved. This is often sometimes called an antibiotic timeout. I'm wondering if any of your homes have gotten this far and are doing that, and if so, if you could share that in chat or maybe at the end when we open up the um, phone lines if you want to share you know, how you went about that. That's a great question, Robin. Okay, so as you're thinking about that, and hopefully somebody has something to share, I um, also have a question from Sue saying, are there any statistics on giving one-dose prophylactic antibiotics prior to dental work, and is this effective? That's a really great, great question. I've heard that answer asked before. I'm not – Kathy, are you aware of – Yeah, that, that is an effective um, – effective um, guideline and should be used with people that have um, some cardiac function or some questions about that. There has, is research on um, the connection between um, dental work and some cardiac um, infections. And so there is um, evidence around that and I know that um, in the work that we're doing with the antibiotic stewardship programs in Minnesota, I've heard that, yes, that is appropriate, and we'll try to give you the handouts for some of those resources. Great. It looks like Catherine has answered. Um, they've gotten a provider review of orders after three days on antibiotics, and they've been open to this. We're lucky and have a rounding MD who's active in our antibiotic stewardship. That's great. So it looks like they are reviewing things, antibiotics after three days, which is a, a really good best practice. Um, here's another question. Is it better to start an antibiotic prophylactically while waiting for a CNS to return or to wait till a proper antibiotic can be chosen? This is a conversation you need to have with your provider. It really depends upon the person's symptoms, but guidelines would suggest that you should wait until you know what antibiotics, um, what the bacterial infection is susceptible to before giving an antibiotic. That's part of the problem with research um, and re developing resistance. If you're in a situation where it does need to be given prophylactically in the hopes that you're going to um, prevent the person from going sepsis or prevent a hospitalization or something else, you need to make sure that you're working with your provider so that as soon as that susceptibility comes back, you make a change um, if that can't prevent it. Yeah, and there's another question similar. Is prophylactic antibiotic use recommended? Why or why not? And, again, I really would think you have to go to your provider on that. But you should always question, always question um, and, um, prophylactic antibiotic use. It, it, it's, it's risky to say that. And we're actually just aware, Kathy and I, of a facility recently that got a citation for um, – using an antibiotic prophylactically, and it wasn't well documented why, and it wasn't the care plan. What to, so so uh, everyone is looking at that. So that's another really great great question. Let's see. So Christina says at her facility, they also do antibiotic timeout after three days. They review the signs and symptoms and vital signs with the provider. That's great. Um, Gretchen is wondering if homes are still using the McGreer's guidelines or has anyone signed up with NHSN to decide uh, the type of infection, especially UTIs. So um, if people want to answer um, in chat about that, go for it. I think the guidelines um, They're still are still recommended. Um, let's see. We're still using McGreer's but are signed up with not are signed up with Nissen right now. Okay, then plan to look. For those of you that might be um, working on a CDI um, project as part of this um, collaborative, um, well, uh, we do anticipate that we're going to have um, we're going to do some education on perhaps also um, monitor once now that you're in, you might also want to monitor UTI. So look for that. That'll be, probably be coming up. Uh, we'll do a little training on that. And here's something that uses the low criteria, which are also um, evidence-based. Okay, good. 
All right, great questions, and I appreciate the um, activity in chat. All right, so you can see that we have, uh, as you mentioned, there's four webinars in this series. And this one, I know some of it might have been basic, but we would just want to make sure everybody was kind of on the same playing field as we uh, get into more details about, uh, next time it will be about clustering difficult on August 8th. And then August 15th, we'll be talking about, we'll be getting more into what really an antibiotic stewardship program is. And then we have um, the privilege on October 22nd of having really a national speaker speaking on antibiotic stewardship and, and really good ideas, practical ideas of where to start. Um, so I hope you're able to participate in those, but keep in mind that they are all recorded. More information about all of these um, webinars as well as registration uh, links can be found at this um, at the link on this slide. Okay. And then I do want to remind you that um, for the next webinar, I think you're going to get the most out of the webinars if you complete uh, the preparatory work that we recommend that you, you do. And today it was that short webinar on antibiotics. This one, is, all we're asking you to do is review um, the National Nursing Home Quality Improvement Campaign's doc document called Infections Probing Questions. And um, this is, I think it will help you if, if your team kind of looks at this beforehand, it will kind of help you see where your gaps might be um, related to um, difficile infection uh, prevention and treatment. So uh, it would be a good idea to have a look at that and you'll kind of, I think, get more out of the webinar. And the other thing I want to remind everyone is I know we've been sending emails out about, out about this, but um, just want to make sure you all are aware that uh, if you want more information about antibiotic use, antibiotic stewardship, clustering difficile, as well as team steps communication strategies to improve quality and safety, you can access free online training sessions that have been developed by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, and the link for that is on the slide. Uh, nursing home leaders can review the content in each session and decide which components would be helpful for themselves and which to include in educating other staff. The components can be shared and discussed during staff education in services or discussion sessions, or they can be accessed by staff online at any time. Sessions are designated to take 30 to 90 minutes per session, depending on the number of components reviewed and the time spent on discussions and activities. Um, the online learning session series is approved to award nursing contact hours, and there's instructions how to get that on the, on the um, training site. Um, these are really good training sessions. They were put together by, you know, really experts in this uh, area, national experts, who really worked hard to make sure that they condensed the information down to what is re what you really need to know and what's the most important. So there's not a lot of extraneous information because they really want to make sure that you can get the highlights and, and what's super important uh, for nursing homes as you work on your infection control program, your antibiotic stewardship program. Okay, so we now have time for questions or comments. Operator, can you remind our participants how to get into queue for questions or comments? Thank you. If you would like to ask a question, please press star then one on your Vextron phone. Okay, I see uh, while you're getting into queue, I'm just trying to see if we have some... Okay, I have several residents on indefinite... Antibiotic prophylaxis for UTIs. Need to have tons of documentation to make sure that it's been a urinary consult, but so far we haven't been cited. Okay. That's good that you're really looking into that. Um, that whole prophylactic and UTI thing is, you know what would be a good, good idea is to make sure we bring this up when our ne uh, in the last webinar when um, Dr. Cernich, I've heard him speak on this, and I think he can give us a great insight uh, and guidelines on that. And then are others calling the hospitals if a resident is admitted to the SNF on antibiotic to assure that this is proper? So feel free to answer that in chat. And another question from Amy, are others calling the hospitals if a resident – oh, that's the same question. Okay. So if anyone wants to answer that, that'd be great. Is anyone in queue? Yes, we do have a question from Gretchen. Please go ahead. Hi, Gretchen. Okay. Hi, thanks for having me. I was just wondering if you could tell me if you have 
a way to print out the slides that was in the YouTube video, which I found extremely helpful for board questions. Oh, that's a really good question. I don't think there are slides attached to that video. I think it is simply just as the video, but we provide you with a link. So yeah. if you want to show it. I have, a, I have a link. I just wondered um, if there was, if there's any way to print the slides. So. You know, I'll, I'll ask, you know, we know who created these, so we could kind of see if, if, if we can get them. They might not want them available at that time. Sure. But uh, how about this? We'll check. If we can find them, we'll make sure we send them out to the group. Oh, thank you so much. Okay, good good question. Okay. Anything else? Any other questions in queue? We had a question from Heather. Please go ahead. Heather. Hi there. Um, we have a few residents um, in our facility that are on anti-infectives like trimethoprim, macrovid, um, a couple are used for prophylactic related to in our estimation colonization of bacteria, primarily E. coli, and two of them. But we have a brand new physician on staff, and he used it to treat a positive E. coli infection that was greater than 100,000 on two of our patients. So I need to know what the state would be looking at, what their perspective would be versus prophylactic treatment because it has been effective um, in one of them for sure. The other one still, she's every time you call to her, she's going to be positive E. coli. Um, what your recommendations are and how I should be managing it from an infection control perspective. Okay. Great question. Uh, obviously, Kathy and I aren't physicians, so we aren't practitioners, so we really can't answer. I think that's a question that you would have to really dig deep with the, with the, with the physician that, that ordered that to really know um, the reason and, and make sure it's well documented. As far as what the state would want, I don't know that the state is looking for exact reasons. They just want to know they just want to be able to find when they look through the documentation from the physician and in the care plan the reason that you're using it and is it justified and is it doing what it's supposed to do. Um, and I'm sorry, I know that's probably not the most, the best question or the best answer, but um, I, again, I would recommend um, if you're going to be listening to the last webinar, this would be a great question for Dr. Cernich. And I think that we'll, we'll have to make sure, give him a little bug in his ear that, uh, to make sure that he talks about, um, prophy, you know, he includes some discussion about prophylactic, um, antibiotics because that seems to be a common, one of the most common questions that we're getting today. And I think it's a great question. And here's somebody that said they got cited for antibiotics being used without symptoms documented. Okay. And here's another one saying doctors are reluctant to contact share the lack of symptoms, document the um, physician rationale for discontinuation or continuation of the antibiotic. Yes, yeah, so we're getting a lot of good, a lot of good comments. Good and comments. Staff. So I hope you read. You all have a broad experience um, in this issue, and that's being reflected in the comments that are up there. Um, this is part of why we do these education series is to have you ask the questions and be able to share with each other. And then we know what you really need to know, too, so we yeah. can make sure we get you the information. Okay, just reading some of these. Not had any issue as long as the culture results reviewed and the symptoms are cleared. Are they pretty good about agreeing to alter the antibiotic course? Okay, great. Any other questions in queue? I'm sure no further questions. Okay. Can you go to the next slide, please? All right. So, thanks very much. Um, this has been a great group, a very uh, lot of good questions. We're going to go over these chat questions, too, and make sure that we um, get back to you on some of these answers, um, especially the ones that we keep hearing over and over again. 
As you exit from the webinar, a window will open up to a short evaluation, so please take a minute to provide feedback on today's session. It's really short, so it shouldn't take you long. Once you've completed that evaluation, you're going to receive a certificate of completion. And so please make sure that everyone on your team that's participated in the webinar receives a copy of the certificate. So you'll just get one, but if there's three of you there, you can just, you know, make more copies. This session was recorded, and it will be available on the Lake Superior Quinn YouTube channel in probably at least in two weeks or even less. Thank you all for participating, and um, you all have a great afternoon. We look forward to um, three more of these with you all, so I hope you can participate. And by the end of August, that you feel more prepared to um, uh, work on your antibiotic stewardship program and your infection control program. Everybody have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes today's class. Thank you for participating. We now disconnect. Mm -hmm.